Welcome back, friends. I am Annabelle, and I am here to read. Every week, first we read a piece of classic literature together, and then we talk about it. If you would like to follow along, down in the video description box, along with some source links and a link to the author's biography, there is a copy of a free ebook. Incidentally, down there, there's also a button to subscribe, which would make a great Christmas present for the YouTuber on the go. It's free, but it's the thought that counts. This week, we are reading The Christmas Ghost by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. In front of Jane White's house roared and surged, beating the rocky shores with unfailing tides, the great Atlantic. The waves floating an occasional fishing vessel were all that passed before her front windows. From gazing all her life at such stern and mighty passers, the woman's face had gotten a look of inflexible peace. Jane White looked as if she would always do her duty, but as if she would spare neither herself nor her friends if they came in the way, as if nothing could interpose between herself and her high-tide mark, not even her own happiness, nor that of others. She was not an old woman, but she seemed to have settled into that stability of old age which comes before the final, greatest change of all. Her days were absolutely monotonous. She lived alone, she kept her old house in order, she made her simple garments. Always on Saturdays, she harnessed her old horse into the wagon and drove into the village three miles away for groceries. On Sundays, she drove as regularly to church. These simple excursions for bodily and spiritual food were all that brightened her life. There were only two houses near hers. In one of them lived a bedridden old woman and her elderly son and daughter, and in the other... David Gleason. The bedridden old woman and the son and daughter had not been on friendly terms with Jane for years, and they had not entered each other's houses. Sometimes Jane used to look down the road to the grey slant of the riding house rising out of the hollow with a scowl of dissent. She could hate with vigour, in spite of the severe peace of her expression. There was a mighty grudge between them. Once the son, Thomas Riding, had paid attention to Jane White, that was in her mother's day, and Thomas's mother and sister had interfered and broken off the match. They had told stories as to Jane's temper and poor housekeeping, and the young man had believed them. He had ceased courting Jane, and she had known the reason. Once afterward, coming home from church, she had stopped her wagon in the narrow, sandy road beside the riding team and taxed the mother and sister with it openly. Thomas had been driving his old gray horse. His mother and sister sat one on each side of him. That was before the old woman had got the hurt which laid her up for life. Jane's mother sat at her left hand, quivering with resentment. She had been a wiry little woman with a fierce temper. Whoa, said Jane to her horse. Then she spoke out her mind once for all to Sarah Riding and her mother. I know what you've said about me. You needn't think I don't, said she. It's all lies, every word of it, said her mother in a panting voice. We've got ears, and we've heard the loud talk, and when the windows were open with the wind our way, Sarah Riding had replied with a vicious click of thin lips. Sarah Riding was pretty, with a hard, sharp prettiness. And we've seen the clothes on the line, said her mother. Mrs. Riding wore a false front, and that and her bonnet were grotesquely twisted to one side. We ain't never had a word in our family betwixt us, and as for our clothes, I'd be ashamed to hang such looking things as yours be out on that line, panted Jane's mother. We've got eyes and we've got ears repeated Sarah, riding. "'Then I should advise your mother to look in the glass when you get home and set her wig and her bonnet straight,' said Jane's mother, unexpectedly. "'Don't, mother,' whispered Jane. Then she shouted glong to her horse, as did Thomas riding to his, but Jane passed him. 
Thomas had not spoken a word during the whole. He left the talking to the women. He had sat still, with his rather clumsy, good-humored face fixed on his horse's ears. He was a little flushed, otherwise he showed no sign of agitation. "'Thomas riding is a dreadful woodeny, anyhow. You ain't miss much,' Jane's mother had observed as they sped along the sandy road. Once she looked back and saw, with that glee over petty revenge which is often seen in an old woman who has lived a narrow life— Old Mrs. Riding, trying to straighten her front piece and her bonnet, which was trimmed with tall, nodding, purple flowers. "'She'd better talk,' said she. "'She'd better gun her own bonnet and wink straight on before she talks about other folks not being neat.' "'I most wish you hadn't said that,' said Jane. "'Why not, I'd like to know.' "'I wish you hadn't. It didn't have anything to do with it. It's like sticking in pins when folks have come at you with hammers.' "'I hope you ain't going to get cracked because Thomas Riding has jilted you,' said her mother, sharply. Jane laughed. "'I ain't one of the kind to be cracked,' said she. And she spoke the truth. She had taken the young man's attentions as a matter of course, very much she had always taken the unfolding of the leaves in the spring. This is something which came to most women, and it seemed to be coming to her. When she saw that she was mistaken— she no more thought of questioning the justice of it than she would have done if a cloud which promised rain had cleared away to fair weather, or the bush which budded last spring had failed to do so this. Matters of that kind, she relegated it entirely to a higher power, and it was easier for her to do so since Thomas Riding was not a young man to awaken easily any girl's imagination. He was such a solid, incontrovertible fact of clumsy flesh and blood, and slowly, steadily working brain, that he could never arouse only observation and acquiescence, never dreams. Jane was fully alive to the humiliation of being jilted, and wrathful as to the interference of Thomas's sister and mother, but... In reality, that, and the stigma cast upon her temper and her neatness, hurt her more at the time than the cessation of the young man's nightly visits. Ever afterward, the clothes which flaunted from the white line shone like garments of righteousness, as, indeed, they had done before. Jane White's little domicile fairly shone with cleanliness, as did her person. Not a hair was out of place on her head. She was clean as one of the wave-washed pebbles on the beach. As for her temper, her mother died soon afterward, and there was no one for her to attack with a loud tongue as she has been accused of doing, unless, indeed, she attacked that hard providence in whose shaping of her destiny she believed. She was absolutely alone from one week's end to the other since she and the Ridings never exchanged calls, and as for David Gleason, he was a single man, and many said an underwit, and kept to himself, never went into another house than his own, and Jane certainly could not call upon him. He was a small, fair-haired man who had come to the place and built his little shack some ten years ago. Nobody knew from whence he came, nor anything about him. He seemed to be quiet and peaceable, and to have enough money for his simple needs, and the stigma of underwit had somehow attached itself to him from his secrecy. People argued that a man would be likely to tell something to his credit if there was anything to tell, and as nobody could imagine him to be a criminal with such a physiognomy, they concluded that he must be lacking in his intellects. He was commonly said to be love crack. Sometimes Jane used to see this man going down the road, moving with a gentle shuffle and slight stoop, and wonder if he were love-cracked. Now and then she felt inclined to ask him to ride when she passed him on the way to church. He kept no horse. But she never did. The man used to look after her, sitting up straight in her wagon and disappearing between the scrubby pines of the coast country with admiration, as any man might have done. The red coil of hair on the back of her head gleamed under her bonnet like a mat of red gold. She held her head and shoulders superbly. 
She was, in fact, a very handsome woman. The severe repose of her face had kept wrinkles at bay, and she had one of those rare complexions which the sea air does not tan and seam and harden, but awakens to life and rosy color. People used to say that there wasn't a young girl that went to church who was any handsomer than Jane White. Still, she never had an opportunity to marry since Thomas Riding deserted her. Everybody, in fact, believed her to be a slovenly housekeeper and to have a bad temper. A fire of scandal is a hard thing to stamp out, and the sparks fly wide and kindle afar. Jane lived alone, with a sort of rigid acquiescence to the will of the Lord and a smoldering hatred of the human instruments who had brought it to pass. In spite of her severe calm of demeanor, she had the natural weakness and longings of her kind. There were times, as the years went on, when she longed for Thomas Riding to come again, as she had never longed at first. She was often afraid, alone in her house, especially in the winter time. She confessed her fears to no one, hardly to herself. What good does it do to be afraid? I know I've got to live alone, and there's no way out of it, she said. I might as well get over it first as last but she was never able to conquer her nervous fears. Often, when the murmur of the waves on the shingle below the bank on which the house stood arose to a roar, and the winter wind was shaking the walls, this lonely human soul in the midst of it would light her candle and peer about the house for the evil which she seemed to feel to be present. Then she would extinguish her candle, and, shading her eyes, press her face close to the window, but she could see nothing except the wild drive of the storm outside. Then the saying in the Bible about the princes of the powers of air would come to her mind, and if she had been a Catholic, she would have crossed herself. A vague fear, which was nonetheless terrible because it was vague, seemed to hold her as in a vise. However, Jane White's health, in spite of her sensitive nerves, was superb. She never had an ache nor ale until two days before Christmas, ten years after her mother died. Then she had a sudden attack of rheumatism, after a spell of damp, warm, unseasonable weather. It was all she could do to hobble about the house. When it came to going to the well for water, she thought at first she could never manage it. Finally, she succeeded, fairly hitching herself over the ground one step at a time. She thought of having the doctor, but she had no one to send for him unless she could waylay someone passing. Both the riding and the Gleason houses were out of hailing distance, and had they not been, she would not have asked any of the dwellers therein to go to the doctor, unless it had been David Gleason. She thought she might ask him, if she were to see him going by. He looked good-natured. But she did not see him, nor any one passing that day. It was midwinter and toward noon the snow began to fall. The old woman thought dejectedly that she didn't know what she was going to do. The stitch in her back was no better, she had no remedies to apply to it, she saw no likelihood of getting the doctor. It was as much as ever she could do to keep up her fire and make herself a cup of tea at nightfall. A sense of utter loneliness, which was fairly desolation, smote her, as she sat alone that evening. She heard the wind roar and the waves break and the dash of the sleet on the window. She seemed to herself loneliness personified, one little human spark in the midst of an infinity of space and storm. At nine o'clock she went to bed. She slept upstairs. She had left the little bedroom on the first floor since her mother died. Her chamber was icy cold. She had heated a soapstone, and she rolled herself in an old flannel blanket and clambered into bed with groans of pain. It was a long time before she went to sleep. Then she slept soundly for a few hours. It was perhaps four o'clock when she awoke with a shock of deadly terror. She knew someone was in the house. She was no longer suspicious that someone was in the house. This time, she knew. 
the storm was still howling outside. She could hear the constant surge of the ocean and the small drive of the sleet on the window. The room was absolutely dark. It must be still far from the winter dawn. She was sure that there was someone in the house. She reached out for the matches which she always kept on the table beside her bed, and as she did so, a cramp of pain seized her from the rheumatism. She nearly screamed, and the matches were gone. She usually moved them from the mantel shelf when she went to bed, but she must have omitted to do so. It had been so difficult for her to get about the night before. Jane endeavored to rise. She thought she would grope her way across the room to the shelf and get the matches, but the pain in her back was so great she dared not make the attempt. She said to herself, what if she should fall and break a bone out there in the dark? It seemed to her that she was safer in the bed. So she lay still, listening, fearfully. She became more and more convinced that there was somebody in the house. She heard movements, soft and guarded, but plainly evident to a sharp ear below. Once or twice, she was sure that she heard a door open and shut. Later on, she heard the pump out in the yard, which had a peculiar creak. She lay bathed in a cold sweat of terror, expecting every moment to hear steps on the stairs, and presently the cold glimmer of dawn was in the room, and she heard a door shut below, then she heard nothing more. Everything was still. It was late before Jane succeeded in dragging herself up with groans and frequent pauses in getting dressed and downstairs. She felt convinced that the visitor, whoever he was, had gone, but she thought of her mother's silver teaspoons and the clock and a gold watch which had belonged to her father and would not go, but was still an impressive gold watch and very dear to her, and she thought of her table linen and everything which was of any value, for she had no doubt then that the visitor was a thief. But when she reached the kitchen, moving by slow and painful stages, she gasped and stared and stared again. A bright fire was burning in the stove. She had wondered if she could by any possibility make a fire with those pains like screwing knives in her back and shoulders. And the table was laid for breakfast, and the room was full of the aroma of coffee, for the pot was on the stove, and a pan of something covered with a towel stood on the back, and when she took the towel off fearfully, there were fresh biscuits. Then a nice little bit of beefsteak was in the frying pan all ready to cook, and the tea kettle was full of hot water, and the water pail in the sink was full. Outside, the storm was still raging, but the kitchen seemed like a little oasis of warmth and comfort in the midst of it. Even the geraniums in the south window had been watered. She heard the cat mew and opened the cellar door. The cat had been out when she went to bed, for she had called her in vain. Somebody had let the cat in and put her down the cellar lest she steal the beefsteak. Who let you in? said Jane feebly, to the cat. She looked at the beefsteak and at the biscuits doubtfully, as if they might be fairy food and have some uncanny property of harm. I was out of meat, and today's Saturday. I couldn't have got down to the store, said she. I didn't have a mite of bread mixed, and I don't know how I could have done it. Finally, Jane White cooked the beefsteak, poured out a cup of coffee, and ate her breakfast, though it was still with an unreasoning terror. It seemed a kindly deed, and yet it was so unexplained that it struck her with all the horror of the unusual. She ate suspiciously, almost as if she thought the food were poisoned. 
When she crept into the pantry to put away the dishes, she had another surprise, for she found on the shelf a little roasting piece, two pies, two loaves of bread, a piece of squash cut, ready to boil, and some washed potatoes. Jane looked at them, white as ashes. My land, said she. She staggered back to the warm kitchen, sat down, and reflected. She tried to think who could have done it, but she was entirely at a loss. For a moment, she had a wild idea of Thomas riding and his old love for her. Then she dismissed it. He'd never get round to it, she said to herself. Then she thought of David Gleason to dismiss that more per and poorly than the other. There ain't anybody in creation who would do anything like this for me, and what's more, there wasn't anybody who knew I had the rheumatism and couldn't do it myself, she argued. She gave it up. She roasted her meat and cooked the squash and potato and remained alone all day. The storm continued until sunset. Then, when the west was a clear, pale gold, the flakes stopped falling, and the earth looked like a white ocean frozen suddenly in the midst of a tumult of rage. As for the real ocean, she could hear the boom of that louder than ever, for its fury does not subside so quickly as that of the earth. It cleared off, very cold. Jane heaped her stove with wood when she went to bed. She burned wood from her own woodland. But she feared it would not last until morning, and she feared she could not get downstairs to replenish it. As night came on, her rheumatism was worse, and then her fears arose to such a pitch that, had it not been for the cold and her illness, she would have actually gone over to the ridings. She went to bed, and lay quaking with sheer terror for some time. At last all was still, and she fell asleep, to awaken as she had done the night before at the sounds below. This time her matches were in reach. She struck one and lighted a candle. Then she pulled up the blanket with painful efforts and wrapped it about her. Then she crept out of bed. Along with the woman's timidity was a spirit of investigation. Had she been a man, she would have been afraid enough to be an excellent soldier. The battle would have been, for her, the only method of ridding herself of her panic. She could never have borne to cower behind breastworks. She crawled downstairs, feeling as if she were a stiff lay figure instead of herself. She planted her feet rigidly as if they were wood. Every step was agony, but she kept on. At that moment, she was more terrified, if anything, to confront the stranger because he had conferred benefits upon her than if he had worked her harm. It would not have seemed so uncanny. In spite of her religious training, the thought of the supernatural was strong in the woman's mind. She thought of her mother, of her father, how they would have felt to know she was all alone, sick with rheumatism in the winter storm, and God knew what she thought next. When she opened the kitchen door, her face was glassly, peering over her candle. The kitchen was lighted, the fire burning. She smelled coffee. It was later than she thought, five o'clock in the morning. She had only a vision of a figure swiftly moving out of sight into the pantry. Then she sprang with a stab of pain to the pantry door and shot the bolt. She had a bolt on the pantry door because the pantry window had no fastening, but she had never used it. After she fastened it, she heard the person whom she had locked in trying to open that window, and said to herself grimly he could not do it. That north window must be frozen down so hard it would be impossible to stir it without hot water. The man, whoever he was, she was sure he was a man, for there had been no flirt of feminine skirts on that flying figure, must have come in through the cellar. The bulkhead had never had a lock, for Jane and her mother, reasoning with the innocent fatuity of some women, had always said, nobody will ever think of coming in through the cellar. The person whom Jane had locked into the pantry did not pound or try to get out. Finally, she took the carving knife from the table. He had been slicing some sausage for her breakfast, apparently. 
and she went to the pantry door and leaned her head toward it, curving her body at a careful distance. "'Who be you?' said she. There was no response. Then she spoke again. "'Who be you?' "'Oh, well, wisher,' came in a feeble voice from the pantry. Then a cold shiver ran again over the woman. Again the supernatural terror reasserted itself. It was much more alarming that a well-wisher should come to her house and do these kindly deeds for her on this wicked earth the night before Christmas. She remembered with an additional shiver that Christmas Day was dawning. Then a burglar. She went over to the kitchen door and stood there, all ready to run, should the person in the pantry make a motion to escape. She kept her eyes riveted on the pantry door. She made up her mind that as soon as it was light enough she would go for the ridings, no matter how they had treated her in times gone by. It seemed to her that the full day would never come, but at last the light broadened and deepened over blue hollows and white crests of snow, and then she saw that a nice path was dug from her door to the well. "'My land,' said she. She took a shawl off the peg, wrapped it around her, pulling one corner over her head, succeeded after many painful efforts in getting into her rubbers, and was about to set out when she caught a glimpse of a man's figure going down the road. It was David Gleason going for his milk, which he had got from a farmhouse two miles toward the village. Jane crept out in the yard a little way and called. He heard her and kept shuffling toward her in a light spray of snow. He had a mild, pleasant face, but Jane, after the prevalent report as to the state of his intellects, felt a little afraid to ask him into the house. "'You go to the ridings and ask Sarah and Thomas to come right over here as fast as they can,' said she. She was almost crying. David Gleason looked at her anxiously. "'Anything the trouble, anything I can do,' he began. But she interrupted him. "'Go as quick as you can,' said she. She was almost hysterical. It seemed to her an age before she saw David Gleason plod into the riding house, and presently he and Sarah, not Thomas, emerge. "'Where in the world is Thomas?' she thought. "'What good can a woman do?' She was glad to see Gleason returning with Sarah. She thought she would not be afraid of Gleason if Sarah were with him, and nobody knew what was in the pantry. Jane met them at the door. Suddenly, her rheumatism seemed better. She moved quite easily. Sarah Riding looked at her half-alarmed, half-indignant. "'What is the matter, Jane White?' said she. "'There's something in the house.' replied Jane, in an awful voice, and the other woman turned pale. "'What do you mean?' "'There is something in the house. It came last night, and made up the fire, and got breakfast, and got the water, and brought roast meat and bread, and it came again tonight, and I came down, and I locked it into the pantry.' "'Did you see it?' asked Sarah, quivering. She grasped Jane's arm hard. The two old enemies fairly clung together, drawn by mutual terror. But David Gleason went close to the pantry door. "'It wasn't a woman, I know that!' gasped Jane. "'Who's in there?' cried David Gleason. There was no reply. "'It told me once it was a well-wisher,' said Jane, and Sarah Riding trembled like a leaf." The reply struck her as much as it had done Jane. Well-wishers abroad in the deadly cold of a winter morning might well arouse terror. "'Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I wish Thomas were here,' cried Sarah. "'I couldn't find nowheres. I don't know, but something's got him. Oh, dear.' "'Who's in there?' demanded David Gleason. He had a firm voice for such a small, slight man." He ain't any more half-wooden than I be, thought Sarah Riding. Then the voice replied again, but with a trifle more emphasis. A well-wisher. Both women started. It's Thomas, cried Sarah Riding. 
Then she flew to the pantry door and unbolted it. Thomas Riding, what be you doing here? She demanded. Be you gone crazy? Thomas Riding, emerging from the cold blue depths of the frozen pantry, looked at once shame-faced and self-asserted. You needn't say a word, Sarah, said he. I saw her having such hard work to get out to the well yesterday morning, and I knew she got the rheumatism, and when the storm begun, I thought of her all alone over here. I couldn't stand it, and... He went on, his voice gathering firmness in spite of an agitation which made him tremble from head to foot. I... I know it was all a lie. You and Mother told about her not being a good housekeeper. There was neat as wax here, and she laid up with rheumatism, too. And as for her temper... Nobody that can get around at all with the rheumatism. Not say anything to be sorry for, ain't got much temper. I wouldn't have minded one mite if she had. I should think you've gone crazy, said Sarah scornfully. Yet her voice softened. Thomas looked pitifully at Jane. Don't seem as if I could stand having you live her alone any longer, he said brokenly, as if his unhappiness over her loneliness were the only thing to be considered. It was the refinement of masculine selfishness. But Jane liked it. I didn't know you thought so much of me, Thomas, said she. Then her face flamed. Well, I haven't got anything to say. You must suit yourself, Sarah said, still in that softened voice. Then she and Gleason went out. Thomas Riding approached Jane and put his arm around her. "'Ain't you been afraid here all alone?' said he. "'Yes, I have, but I didn't suppose you cared.' "'I did,' said he. "'There's no use in raking up bygones, but I know I've treated you mean.' "'Yes, you have,' admitted Jane impartially, but her eyes upon his face were tender." It wasn't so much because I was afraid you were a bad housekeeper and bad-tempered. I, I didn't believe it, and I wouldn't have minded if you had been, but I backed out because Mother and Sarah felt so. I guess Mother will feel different now, but I can't help it if she don't. As for Sarah, I can't help it either. You ain't going to be left alone here any longer. How's your rheumatism, Jane? I guess it's better... I haven't thought of it, replied Jane. Then the outer door opened suddenly, and Sarah Riding looked in. David Gleason's face showed over her shoulder. Wish you a Merry Christmas, said Sarah. Her thin, pretty face was quite transformed by a sudden triumph of the best within her. The man behind her beamed with friendliness toward these people who were nothing to him. It was suddenly borne in upon the consciousness of Jane White that love and kindness were not such strangers upon the earth as she had thought. The End So, behind the scenes, I have a whole, like, database of stories that I like to pull from, just so I'm not like, oh, what's the next story? So, I almost put this one into my maybe-to-never pile, just for the first line, the inflection of that was so difficult to get correct because it's such an awkward kind of phrasing. Almost parenthetical phrase, which is easy to read on the page but very difficult to narrate. In front of Jane White's house roared and surged, beating the rocky shores with unfailing tides, the Great Atlantic. <laughs> what? And this particular story has a lot of, like, very kind of odd phrasings like that, where there's a parenthetical phrase in the middle that doesn't seem awkward to read on the page, but it's really strange to narrate. The Christmas Ghost was initially published in December of 1900 in Everybody's Magazine, which is a really weird, like, it's a very, like, Abbott and Costello, who's on first kind of thing. Whose magazine was she published in? Everybody's Magazine! No, really, whose? Like, everybody's? No, everybody's magazine. And I really, really enjoy this one, both from the perspective of like, it's a, it's a nice Christmassy kind of story and everybody's kind of happy throughout it. And it's, it's just kind of a nice story, you know? 
but also I really enjoy how it takes the trope of the Victorian ghost story and kind of twists it a little bit to turn it into a more um, traditional kind of like goodwill towards men sort of Christmas story. And to me it's funny because Mary E. Wilkins Freeman is kind of known for um, the genre that she's usually known for is realism. The stories of realism are generally <sighs> realistic. <laughs> which means that you don't have a lot of the supernatural elements. And Mary E. Wilkins Freeman is known as being supernatural realism in a lot of her stories. But realism is in direct contrast to romanticism, which was also going on at the time. And romanticism, the most satisfying conclusion to the story that was constructed is the ending and there's usually it's very convoluted how you get there and there's a whole lot of coincidental happening focuses a lot on like overwrought emotion and like love stories and like romance it's very like in my feels it's very gerard way my chemical romance there's a sense of isolation. There is this woman who is in peril. It's not just isolation, but it's isolation as a result of like nature. Like in Wuthering Heights, it's like the moors. And in this story, there's the driving storm and it's all snowy and there's the hostile Atlantic on one side. Um, and so that very much plays into the romantic part of it. But as it turns out, she's not really all that alone. She is not actually really imperiled. There's no super natural element at all, which is usually a crucial element. Like obviously the, Vic the Victorian ghost story usually has ghosts. Believe it or not, Anna, come on. It's kind of funny because that's the kind of thing that based on, you know, her lifespan and all that kind of, she, uh, Mary E. Wilkins Freeman probably grew up reading those, having those stories read to her or reading those stories at Christmas in the Victorian era. Like that's just kind of what they did. It was just, it was like the Grinch, only instead of five different versions of the Grinch, they had, you know, a Christmas carol. Mary E. Wilkins Freeman was actually very savvy because she wrote a lot of Christmas stories because people really wanted to read Christmas stories around Christmas. So the magazines would buy a lot of Christmas stories. And she had a few books which kind of like vaulted her into like, hey, like local celebrity, like maybe like in the state, people would really recognize her at, in, in the span of her life. Now she's very much known for uh, writing a lot of feminist literature, um, which came later in her career. But um, she wrote a lot of very diverse things because she was writing to make money. Like she really needed to make sure that she published a lot of stories because she was keeping her entire family afloat. Her, both of her parents died when she was relatively young. I think she was around 30 when her dad finally kicked it and left them like no money at all. But she was basically writing for survival. And then a little bit later, she met her husband, Mr. Freeman, and he turned out to be I don't want to be overly harsh to him because he seems like he had a lot of mental illness going on, but it seemed like he treated that mental illness with alcohol. And that was kind of the mentality that she had. Like she had to work for herself and because she knew that nobody else was going to help her or save her. And that kind of makes the story, which was written when she was like 45, 50, it kind of gives this story a little bit of a maybe sad twist. While Mary wasn't exactly as given to making kind of like, I, I don't want to call it like a self-insert Mary Sue character, you can kind of see a line between her fierce independence and the protagonist of this story kind of being independent, but also she's very, very grateful and glad that these people who she was, you know, somewhat adversarial with still, you know, thought enough of her and had that, you know, milk of human kindness to come and help her at Christmas. And I did find it almost like funny is not quite the right word, but um, I did enjoy how toward the end, she still keeps that like fierce little glimmer of that early feminism where um, Thomas says, you know, oh, you're going to come live with us now. And she recognizes Hey, 
but okay. Okay, I will. <laughs> like, she she sees that she has, like, she has to recognize that. She, can't, she cannot let that go without, she can't let that just slip by without saying something about it, but, <laughs> but she was still very grateful. It was just kind of a nice little Christmas story. If you liked this nice little Christmas story, make sure to leave a like down below so that I know that you liked it. So maybe I'll read some more nice Christmas stories instead of the depressing ones. Next week, Little Match Girl! But I hope that this has maybe contributed to a slightly happier holiday, if that's your kind of thing. I hope to see you guys next time. Bye!